I'm Elliot Forrest from WQXR in New York. Joining me, international conductor, man about town, Leonard Slatkin. You know him from so many years, both the St. Louis Symphony, the Detroit Symphony, the Lyon Symphony. Leonard, thank you so much for spending some time with me. It's very nice to see you, Elliot, if not in person. Uh, yeah, we've spent a little bit of time together. I think the last time was at the Clyburn uh, competition. And uh, before that, I hosted one of your birthday parties. It was really... Yeah, I'm uh, having one every three months now, so I can have <laughs> you around. <laughs> so uh, I had read you you kind of in this crazy time of being home that you, you have a routine of a bit. You, you, you've established that. Tell us what you're up to. Yeah, part of these were projects that were beginning before we were asked to stay home and some of them just popped into my head and I started doing them. So here's how it works. I get up in the morning, I have a bottle of boost because being at home all this time, I can actually control my diet. It is not very easy to do on the road. So I'm on a low carb diet. I'm bound and determined to get to the weight my doctor wants and then probably after that, see if I can get down to the weight my wife wants. I just, I just want to pause you for a second. You said a bottle of boost, not booze, right? I just want to be clear. I can't. <laughs> Too many carbs. But I do have a glass of wine at dinner. It's my one sheet. So anyway, after I do that, I come up to my studio, which is normally a place I do emails. I do writing for books, things like that. But... For the last oh, almost six months, I've been recording a radio show that at first was just airing here in St. Louis. And now it's gone national via internet, I guess international. And usually I would go down to the radio station and record five or six of them at a time. It's called the Slatkin Shuffle, if you want to look it up and see how to get to it. It's not like anything other than what I did when I started here in St. Louis 50 years ago. Basically, I put the iPad on shuffle mode. I have about 12,000 tracks, and I just see what comes up, and then I talk about them. Uh, it is a really very bizarre mixture of things, but I also have a lot of discoveries, especially stuff from World War II done by my parents. Anyway, what I had to do in order to be able to do this at home was create a studio, and if we can turn this a little bit, I can't zoom in, I don't think, but you can see some computers and stuff like that. That's a blackout curtain because if it gets too bright during the daytime, you can't see anything. And then if I come back here, and maybe if I move out of the way, you can kind of see another table with a microphone on it. Uh, and it's working out pretty well, just time consuming. I've learned that I have come to really be jealous of producers and engineers. They make it seem so easy. What would we do without them? So that's the morning. Then I usually have a bit of lunch. And then I have my mid-morning matinee. You know that I'm a film buff, but I'm also a television buff. When you grow up in Hollywood, you can't help it. So you have all those composers and actors and people I knew. When I'm on the road and working, you find me in the movie theater, usually in the afternoon, somewhere, usually twice a week, seeing almost everything. I just love movies. Roger Ebert told me, they're movies. You don't call them films, you don't call them cinema. It's movies. <laughs> so I always watch one, and usually that's something that Cindy, my wife, would not want to see. She's not into much less a drop of blood appearing on the screen. So I get into all kinds of things that way. Then after that, I usually come back up and try to record one more radio show. If I don't feel like doing that, I start on a chapter of an upcoming book, which will be called Musical Chairs, which is different than my first two in that it is more exploratory of what's going on today, meaning before virus quarantine and perhaps afterwards things that I've observed over the years. What will make this very different is that I think in a, in a week, we're going to post the titles of the chapters online. Each chapter is on something, on composers, on music directors, on the theater, 
on audiences, on diversity. And aside from the first one that goes up where I'll actually show the part I've written, all the others will then just have the titles and people will submit questions, which if they fit into what I think the chapter should be, I'll put into the book. So it'll be not an interactive book, but something that they can participate in, which I think will be interesting. So that's the afternoon and then comes dinner time with the glass of wine and everything else minus carbs. There are tasty dishes you can do. I've always enjoyed cooking, so I get to do that along with my wife. We had fun with that. And then we go down and we usually watch a film that she would be interested in as well as me. In fact, last night, it's been online now for a couple of days, I showed her a 1953 television show that my parents did as the Hollywood String Quartet. It was a pilot for a series that was supposed to come out, but it never picked up sponsorship. And yet for a half hour, you can get this on YouTube, you can watch the Hollywood String Quartet and not only see how they played, but hear them. It's just amazing. I'm not just saying that because I'm the son of two of the four. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you're you're uh, unusual in the sense that I, I, I wonder after two, three, four weeks, a couple of months of this, I, I believe there will be a, a large creative output. Yeah, you're writing, other people are writing, other people are writing and performing, um, but not only just yeah. uh, books and articles, but writing music. I, I, I wonder if there's a post-virus creativity uh, uh, that, that will come out of all of this, and, and maybe that's one thing that's good. I think the important thing is that a lot of people who now are having to have more free time on their hands are perhaps discovering more creative sides of their own persona. It may have nothing to do with music at all. Unfortunately for me, I'm in that profession where just looking at the camera and doing doesn't do much good without the people playing it. <laughs> that was the first five bars of Beethoven than fifth. Okay? Yeah, yeah, it's a little hard to do I, that alone. Not, not in my usual interpretation. That was yeah. done in a different way. So, I've tried to reach into different aspects of particularly what I liked when I was doing young, because in addition to the musical chairs book, I've been trying my hand at some fiction. I loved to write when I was in school, particularly what then was called science fiction. I believe Harlan Ellison coined the term speculative fiction. I think all fiction probably is, but I don't know where I'm going to go with that, but it's kind of fun to sit down and just jot down ideas that come out of nowhere. My one concern is that with this creative spark, that part's good. It's the recreative spark that's going to be a little bit tricky because if we wind up getting so used to watching performances on mediums such as we're using right now, and listening to them that way, I wonder if it doesn't make bringing the audiences in for live performance a little more difficult the longer it goes on that we do not have live performances with public. How long will it be before the public is not worried about sitting six feet away from each other in a hall? What will the halls do? This is having an incredible impact on the arts industry. Almost everybody is an independent artist. Soloists are, conductors are, singers are. Orchestra members are not, but as we've been reading every day, orchestras have had to make their own decision about how or how not they might be paid. And sadly, some have had to be furloughed altogether with the idea that they will come back. But I don't know that any group is gonna come back the same way. It depends on the level of philanthropy that's out there because we certainly know the government is not going to do it. It's going to take a lot of committed people who don't lose quite so much in their portfolios. We saw that in the downturn in 2008. We saw it after 9-11. But this one is different. This is something that we can't control yet. There's no one. And as much as we like listening to the medical experts, maybe less so to the government ones, there is no prediction yet of where the end is and what toll it will take. 
I um, I'm equally concerned, uh, Leonard, about the the nature of the performing arts and where it goes from here. Even when we do go back, uh, as you've indicated, some orchestras have completely um, cut off their musicians. Some of them are taking pay cuts. It's it's a variety of things. It was really interesting. I was reading an article this morning uh, about the Marx Brothers during the Spanish flu. Um, had performed back on stage when things were starting to be clear. And, and much to my surprise, they would only sell half the house um, so that people um, in uh, 1918, I think, uh, were seated every other one. Um, you know, what happens to uh, a place like Carnegie Hall that is either on their own or through government mandate said you can only sell half the tickets? One problematic to was... me is the smaller institutions which have lower budgets, granted, but they already are at the bursting point in terms of going over budget. And a lot of those musicians rely on other jobs. When you come to the community orchestras, the semi-professional ones, it's not of the same. It's all over the world. Everybody is dealing with the same problem, but I suspect that we will be looking at individual solutions for individual institutions. No two institutions probably should try to solve this in the same way. Every community is different. Everyone needs a different kind of solution. Uh, on a lighter note, I wanna combine something if I could. Um, you uh, had uh, talked about delving into science fiction, and uh, I, I listened to several of your radio broadcasts, the Slatkin Shuffle, and one of the things you had uh, talked about, uh, or one of the things you played was Lost in Space. You, you yeah. played music from uh, John Williams, and you know there's a new Lost in Space reboot on I'm Netflix. Watching it, too. but they do use his theme. Just and the the real, Well, but the trivia part of it is, he wrote the first two season themes, and they are different. If you go to season one of the original, you hear a different theme than he wrote for season two. And I, I love, uh, I, you know, John Williams' music all together, but I've been enjoying the new Lost in Space, and it was really great to hear that music as well. Just generally... You know what else, you know what else he wrote for, for television? People don't think about it. He did Time Tunnel, which is a show I loved when I was a kid. Me too. He did the was it the Land of the Lost, a little strange, but a fun show. And my favorite of all those TV themes from the old days was the Craft Suspense Theater. Check it out on YouTube. That's that's John Williams at his youngest, when he's still really influenced by jazz. And you hear it in this. It's really worth hearing that theme. Craft Suspense Theater. The, oh, you know, I was confusing. You're right, but Lost in Space, because now that Amazing Stories is back. There they do use the complete theme music and three great tunes in that one minute opening sequence. And uh, I, I started myself, uh, I went back because it's on Netflix as well and there's more time on our hands. Started watching uh, The Twilight Zone from the very beginning. Um, they're all in order and sequenced uh, on, on Netflix as well. And I was surprised to see um, uh, not only Bernard Herrmann, uh, but other great film composers, oh, yeah. uh, not just the themes, but uh, the, the incidental music for those early, reason, early shows. The reason it's interesting here is the theme was written by one Marius Constant. He was French. He wrote classical music. He was the first teacher of orchestration at the Paris Conservatoire. And I do a piece that he made an orchestration of, the Ravel Gaspard de la Nuit, recorded it. And nobody had ever heard of this guy. And I just would look at them and I would go. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yes, you he have heard to, of him. He did not have to write another note in his life. <laughs> no. And it was minimalism before we even knew that what, what that yeah. was. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've discussed this with different uh, composers and different conductors, but there definitely uh, now is this, is this recognition of film composers and not only hearing their movie music in the concert hall, but there was a time period where there was very much a separation that, that, that film composers were literally not welcome in, in the concert hall. And, I, and I'm just curious, I know different theories about this, but we have never talked about that. And I just thought I'd ask what your theories were. Of course, there's a long version and a short version. The middle version is the transition from silent to sound. The only thing that was consistent is there always was music. In silent films, it was a pianist, could be a little small group, could be an organ. 
now we got to sound. So people hadn't paid much attention to the music and they continued not to pay much attention until we got to World War II when all of the immigrants came over, Korngold, Steiner, Boxman, Tionkin, Tedesco, so forth and so on. Now you had epic scores coming out where the music began to be recognized, but only thought of as music for films. Just taking it and excerpting it within a concert was not deemed acceptable because film to a lot of people was a lowbrow form of art. That kind of writing for film disappeared for a while and then John brought it back. There were followers of John's, ones who were writing to him, but you could still go back and say, okay, Jerry Goldsmith, Elmer Bernstein, people like that. They were great composers and they became decent enough conductors and well-known enough that they could bring whole programs of their music into the concert hall. Now we've come to the time when two things happen. The music itself, if it's memorable enough, works well as concert pieces. But we're seeing almost every major orchestra, not just here, but around the world, playing full scores to the film as it's shown on screen. It is a marked change from what we knew back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And it all changed. And to me, of course, I grew up out there. I was on the sound stages. You had the best musicians in the world playing in the, these 11 studios. When you have that kind of quality and that type of caring, and those musicians loved playing in the film studios. It was challenging. Those weren't easy, easy scores. Look at any Bugs Bunny cartoon. You'll hear six minutes, fast music throughout, no pause. That stuff was hard and it was being written literally as they were performing. It would go from the composer to the person writing it as an orchestration, then to the copyist, and then wet ink onto the musician's stands. That's how it was. And now we appreciate it. Of course, now we actually have more rehearsal time. I want to ask you too about the level of playing of young people these days. I I, I, you're obviously much more of a trained ear than I am, uh, but I'm also proud of the fact that I'm on the New York Youth Symphony Board, where you were, old you, band. you were music director. My first orchestra. Yeah. What uh, What are you, What are your remembrances of the New York Youth Symphony? Well, I was asked to be the assistant conductor. I can't remember the year exactly, and I got to conduct my debut, literally my first appearance in Carnegie Hall was with that orchestra doing William Schumann's New England Triptych. And Schumann came to the concert. So you can imagine what a thrill that was. And then for the, what was it, three years maybe that I led the group, we commissioned a couple pieces. I think the orchestra got better. I have always promoted youth and music. I founded the Youth Orchestra here in St. Louis 50 years ago and it's celebrating its anniversary this year. Unfortunately, a lot of those celebrations have to be postponed. Every place I went, I've always worked with young people because I was a member of youth orchestras when I was a kid. I attempted to play viola. In fact, I believe viola jokes originated as being about me, <laughs> sure of it. Uh, and this experience, it's one that brings everybody together. They come from all over a given city or community. Now they even put orchestras together worldwide. Imagine they come from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, certainly gender. There's no discrimination. And all these people who never knew each other get together. They all get along and they are there for the purpose of one thing. Make music. Satisfy the soul and the spirit. Now if the rest of the world could be like that, we'd be in a much better place. I want to end uh, with uh, um, the last time you and I talked, uh, it was because the Emmy Awards uh, oh. were honoring, oh, they thought, Andre Previn, who had passed away and, and then inadvertently put up a picture of you. You ended up being on Jimmy Kimmel. You were on the radio yeah. with me to let everybody know that you were okay. And, and I'm, I'm still here, see? Yeah. April Fools. He's here, here right? Wednesday, right? It's still April, here. Right. 
Um, I just, uh, when asked about that, you put the spotlight rightfully right back on Previn to honor him. And because it was, you know, in a way odd and admittedly funny and, 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 and in a way kind of silly and inappropriate for them to have made that mistake. But you really spent some time honoring him because he was. Uh, well, that was the, the main point. Remember, a lot of people at the uh, Emmy Awards wouldn't know who Andre Previn was. Right, right. And well, I, I think everyone I straightened it out. Now that we seem to have this celestial internet going on, I did get a message from him. And he <laughs> said that should I win an Emmy, they want his picture to go up. Fair enough. Makes sense to me. Leonard, I'm glad you're well. I'm glad you're keeping you, busy. Uh, I will encourage everyone to take a listen to the Slatkin Shuffle. And Not the Curly forward. Shuffle. No Curly Shuffle. Slatkin <laughs> Shuffle. And I look forward to seeing you in person. Thanks for doing this. Elliot, stay safe and healthy. You too. Best to you.